It is known as the Smiling Coast, a place for tourists to meet the country's welcoming people. But the Gambia is also the scene of murder, rape, torture, even witch hunts and forced labour, all during the 22-year rule of Yahya Jame. He came to power as president in a bloodless coup in 1994 before being elected in 1996. His time as president turned increasingly towards authoritarianism. Notable crackdowns on journalists and any opposition. He withdrew the country from the Commonwealth, began its withdrawal from the International Criminal Court and declared the Gambia an Islamic Republic. As from today, Gambia is an Islamic Republic. Islamic Republic. There will be an Islamic State that will respect the rights of all citizens and non-citizens. Jame fell from power in a shocked defeat in 2016. And since then, the Gambia's own Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission has recommended a series of prosecutions for those responsible. Jame himself is now a fugitive, living in exile in Equatorial Guinea. But those who suffered under his regime have a potential chance for some justice. And a historic trial is getting underway in Switzerland of Usman Sonko, the former right-hand man and interior minister of Jame. He'll face justice for crimes against humanity. He's said to have been at the real heart of the brutal repression. Well, Sarah Sacco, Simon Martin and Sam Brampis revisit Yaya Jame's The Gambia for France 24. The Gambian capital, Banjul, bears few visual signs of Yahya Jame's brutal dictatorship. Seven years on from the fall of the regime, Arch 22 is one of its last enduring features. The monument, which looms over a key road in the city centre, was erected in the mid-90s to mark the military coup d'etat which brought Jame to power. It conjures uncomfortable memories for Madi Sisse. I personally feel too bad because it uh, always reminds me of the atrocities that the Jame regime has put on me and Gambians. There has been the 22 years of Jame's regime or more, was more or less of a very brutal regime where people's rights were trampled on, some people were killed for nothing, some were beaten for nothing. There were a lot of disappearances. All right. Today, Sisse is an MP on a quest for justice. He took us to see a new memorial, recently installed on the other side of the arch. Well, this pictures you are seeing on the wall, on these statues, these are pictures of victims of Jame. These people were arrested and tortured after being accused by the Jame regime of crimes including coup plotting, activism and even witchcraft. Most of the perpetrators have never been held to account. The current government has uh, promulgated certain laws that can try crimes of torture. Uh, these are all legislations that will help to try some of the perpetrators. So I am a little bit relieved and very hopeful that uh, very soon uh, we will have justice. Madi has been waiting for justice for nearly 20 years. He is a plaintiff in the trial of Usman Sonko, Jame's former interior minister, which is being held in Switzerland. Back in 2006, Madi was working as a journalist and was arrested on Sonko's orders. He was held in a cell by the intelligence services and tortured for weeks alongside a colleague. They wouldn't choose what to beat you with. They would beat you with anything. Scables, sticks, they kick you. And we sustained a lot of injuries on our bodies. So when we were sitting in the reception before we were taken back to the cells, Musa told me that we have to run away, otherwise they will kill us here. And he, he could be right. We could, we could die. We could, we could die in their hands because the way they beat you, as if they are not beating a human being. Madi survived his horrifying experience, but many were not so lucky. We all know human rights, uh, respect for human rights. But in the 22 years of Yame, sometimes somehow we lost our way. So we use those stories 
to, to use it and examine what went wrong, where, and how do we move forward as a, as a as government to re-establish a culture of respect for human rights and rule of law in particular. By this law, you see, look at this happened in 26, in all of these years. Sira Ndao is the founder of Memory House, a museum come gallery that serves as a memorial site to victims of the regime. Her uncle was among the many Gambians assassinated by Jame's men. The site forces visitors to confront the darkest chapter in the Gambia's history. For more than two decades, people here lived in constant fear. Opposition figures, activists and ordinary citizens faced a very real risk of torture, kidnapping and forced disappearances under the paranoid dictatorship. You could get arrested for basically anything and everything. For, 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 saying, the, for saying anything against Yaya Jame, for believing in anything against what he believed in. Um, he arrested people that he accused of being witches with no evidence. He basically kidnapped and, and detained people he, with HIV AIDS and forced them to drink medicines to cure them. There was a man who was arrested for not standing up because Yaya Jame was passing by. He was actually beaten and tortured because Yaya Jame's convoy was passing and he did not stand up. Many of the atrocities were carried out by a notorious pro jame militia, known as the junglers or as the Black Black, on account of their dark uniforms. The junglers who put plastic bags over their head, strangled them, suffocated them until they die, then they were buried behind canals. Memory House also aims to stop the victims from fading into obscurity, taking care to emphasize their humanity. Kanyiba was a charismatic, very intelligent young, young man. Yahya Jame saw him as a threat and ordered for him to be picked up. And he was picked up in 18 September 2006, and until today, nobody knows his whereabouts. 17 years on from his disappearance, Kanyiba Kanyi's family still don't know what happened to him on that fateful day. Mm, okay. They still live in the same village on the edge of Banjul. He was kidnapped by Jame's agents from outside this very house. His widow, Isatu, hasn't been able to let go of the pain ever since. These pictures bring me memories of happiness at the time. He was very loving, caring. We used to sit here and laugh, chat. He helped me with the cooking and everything. The pain that they put on us, we can't forget it till we're dead. It's like it stopped our life then. Since her husband's disappearance, Isatu has tried to find out the truth. She even pursued Jame's regime through the courts in a bid to gather information. Her struggle continues in vain to this day. She lives with her son, Lamin, who never got to know his father. The empty chair in front of them has served as a constant reminder for nearly 20 years. I lost hope. We don't understand why nobody can find anything up to now. Even today, we don't know anything about what happened to him. We are suffering, and we don't have anything, any support. What I see is that the government doesn't care about the victims. The Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission has been investigating Jame-era crimes for nearly two and a half years and has made some progress towards justice. In 2021, the Commission recommended that judicial proceedings should be launched against a dozen figures, including Jame himself. The following year, the government promised to go after the former dictator. But for many people, including Ayesha, this is not enough. Her father was the cousin and a close confidant of Jame, but still ended up assassinated by the junglers. She says that the process is moving too slowly and is pushing for faster action. Oh, yeah. 
And well, it's my favorite quote actually, leave, learn and hope. As an activist, she has been making a podcast called The Victims Podcast for three years now. She's already produced more than a dozen episodes in which she gives voices to victims as well as experts on transitional justice. For us to attain justice at the end of the day, we have to also put pressure, advocate, speak on platforms, make sure government hears like, these conversations almost every day so that they would, would really do something at the end of the day. Through the Victim Podcast, we will talk about key issues about the transitional justice, the plight of the victims, and the way forward. We will take a look at some key elements of the transitional I think there's, there's, there's a total lack of political will in, in the transitional justice field. It's more like ticking the boxes sometimes, I feel. Okay, let's just do this. Let's just tick these boxes and let's just maybe reparate victims and then we, we forget about it. But it's not about what happened to us and other victims. It's about ensuring that this thing doesn't happen again. After years of vague promises, the government seems to be moving towards concrete action. In May, President Adama Barrow announced plans to create a new hybrid court charged with prosecuting 70 alleged human rights abusers from the Jame regime, as recommended by the Truth Commission. The Justice Ministry has appointed a new special prosecutor to lead proceedings. The tribunal will eventually combine both Gambian and international criminal law. So, for instance, torture uh, wasn't codified in the Gambia. But torture um, is an international crime, it's customary international law. So, for you to prosecute uh, people alleged to have committed torture, I mean, the tribunal needed to have um, an international jurisdiction. It must be a kind of a judicial setup, a chamber that will be able to invoke international customary law. Uh, so, that's the reason we are going hybrid. Some are pushing for wider reforms of the Gambian judiciary to build its capacity to prosecute human rights violations. Madi Sisse, the journalist turned MP who was tortured under Jame, is among them. He was elected soon after the fall of the regime. What was the issue during Jame's time? Is the application of the laws, because there has been a lot of executive interference in the judicial system. Today marks a significant moment for Sisse as he defends two important reform bills in parliament. So if these laws are passed now, if the amendments are passed now, it will help in the judicial system of this country, especially uh, crimes that have been committed by the previous regime. If the proposals are accepted by parliament, they will give greater powers to lawyers and judges. Thank you, thank you. That's a good one. Figures who will ultimately have the final say in determining the fate of many of Jame's inner circle. Honorable Speaker, that would take me to the conclusion. Criminal laws protect, serve and limit human actions and to help guide human conduct. His efforts paid off. The bills were approved unanimously by the House. Survivors of the regime had no choice but to continue with their lives, but their scars are yet to heal. You see? Come on, go! <laughs> Sisse and others are now looking to the international stage, seeking accountability from the perpetrators who fled abroad, like Usman Sonko, the former interior minister. Sisse is one of the plaintiffs at the trial in Switzerland. It is a build-up to having, if not total justice, but then to have the biggest fish caught, and that is the former president, because he is really uh, the brain behind all the violations. As for Jame, he is currently living in exile in Equatorial Guinea, a country which has no extradition treaty with the Gambia, making an imminent trial unlikely. But Sisse remains optimistic. We have set of foundations that are going to that creates strong institutions 
where when violations happen, it's nipped in the bud. So I'm really confident that uh, what had happened will never happen again, and my children and other children will really enjoy a better uh, life in the Gambia, as opposed to what we have undergone. Sise believes that the foundations for a new Gambia have been set, but other victims are growing impatient with the excruciatingly slow rate of progress. The only former head of state in the region to face successful prosecution for human rights violations was Isen Abre, the Chadian dictator, who was found guilty in 2016 after a 17-year legal battle. Sarah Sacco, Simon Martin and Sam Bradpiece revisiting Yaya Jamez the Gambia for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. There's more news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.